Today, I'm going to teach you three best ways on how to build a business. Aaron Knightley is an investor, TikToker, and business owner, having founded the Breakout Program and Peak Performance Events. He is here to show you how to escape the nine to five. When people turn around and say money isn't the root of all happiness, they've obviously had a very blessed life. Stop financing your Audi for 600 <laughs> quid. Start putting that in the bank. And then maybe when you get spoken down to by this little graduate squirt, you might have a backbone to say, who the fuck are you talking to? Money makes me extremely happy. Most people are not financially empowered because they've been really bad with money. So it's really scary. 43 million working adults hate their job. What situation are you in financially or at home that you are not saying enough? Why don't you design a life that you don't have to escape? I live a very lean financial life. I'm sitting here in a Primark t-shirt. I don't spend money on expensive things. A young person who is frustrated in their nine to five, how do they break out of their nine to five? First thing I say to anyone. Aaron, welcome to Now To Be A Leader. Thanks so much for having me. Nice to meet you. And you. So we met over Instagram, TikTok, and emails. Yeah. And nice to see you in person. Yeah, likewise. Looking forward to it. So you talk a lot about quitting the nine to five. Why is being employed so bad? So funny enough, I wouldn't say it is so bad. So I think that's where the maybe the mis message of what people look into it is that it's so bad. Uh, for the record, I actually really enjoyed my last job. I actually had some of the funniest times at my last job. Uh, I do talk about that. What it is, is it's the politics, the stress, the Groundhog Day feeling, the limited growth, the constantly playing what I call a political poker game. You're always having to think on your feet of who's making the next move. It's like a constant workplace chess game. That's really strenuous. And from my experience and people I know, it leads to a lot of problems, anxiety, depression, being apprehensive, not enjoying your job. So it's that element of employment that I was just never on board with. Whereas entrepreneurship, you choose who you work with, you choose how fast you go, you choose your salary depending on the success of your business. So I think when you look at the two and you break it down, I feel there are so many more pros with building a business than there ever will be in employment. So that's kind of the the deeper message within it. Mm. Yeah, because a lot of the times you talk about, you know, oh, you know, promoting the quiet quitting and, you know, don't stay in your nine to five, break out of it. And, you know, fully, totally see how, you know, being in a company where you have a toxic boss, it's a toxic environment where you have to navigate the politics and generally dealing with, you know, very uncomfortable and sometimes things completely outside of your control. Whereas the whole, you know, entrepreneurship route does offer that sense of freedom, being able to choose who you work with, both clients and, you know, collaborators, potential business partners. Um, talk to me about your journey breaking from nine to five. So you mentioned that you really enjoyed your, your work, uh, you were employed. Talk to me about your journey. How did that happen? So from a young age, I've all I've ever known, like we spoke off camera, all I've ever known is that working class, getting on with work, hard work, labor work, you know, the harder you work, you know, the, the more you can keep your job, you can secure your job and that kind of thing. And that's what I saw. And I saw good habits. I just always knew that I had a bit of a flair, very outspoken, very loud, very confident, very boisterous. And I've always had natural leadership skills, which is massive to me, which I'm sure we'll talk about. So when I went when you into that's it, what do you mean? In terms of leadership skills, I have always been able to sort of bring people together by an element of respect, which, you know, I'll talk a, a little bit about shortly in terms of that's a massive thing for me in terms of doesn't matter who you are, how much you earn as human beings, you know, respect really is due for everyone. Right. And the more you show that you're going to get a great output. You know, and, and that's what lacks in the workplace, which was one of my ma major gripes. So when I went into the workplace, I knew I wanted to do more. I didn't know what it was because in an entrepreneur's journey, especially early on, when you haven't got that education, you know you want more, but you don't know what it is. And you're like, mm, oh, this isn't sitting well with me. You're telling me what to do. I'm, I'm kind of not liking that, you know, and the way that you're talking to me, I don't like that either. So I had like these early signs. So as I was working and, you know, I've nearly done 10 years in full, nearly, of the employed world, I just, 
I just saw these problems I just didn't want to be involved with. From the gossiping, I'm not into gossiping. I didn't want to play off um, against other people. I didn't like the fact that you can befriend someone, get really close, and then they turn on you for a promotion in a heartbeat and they won't think anything of it. But as you go through life and the workplace and you've been there years, you learn that, oh, actually, everyone is out for themselves and to pay their bills, which is another element of this whole um, fear of losing your job. Most people are not financially empowered because they've been really bad with money. So that's an element of the competition. So during my work years, I just, I didn't like the way people spoke to each other. I didn't like this backstabbing. In my last place, people would stay longer for, to, you know, to brown nose managers, to get promotions. And I used to think, why is no one thinking for themselves? Like, why, why are you not working on yourself? And anyway, I got introduced into business from an old business partner years ago. I started exploring entrepreneurship. I started an eBay business. I started a little wedding business. They made money, then they didn't make money, and then we closed them. And I was just trying everything to get out of my job. What were you doing? What was your job? I was in logistics. Okay. So, um, but there was also a role of, um, there was an engineering part of it as well uh, to begin with, but then it was predominantly like scheduling in logistics and it was a good job, like very easy. I just didn't like the politics. I hated it. I hated seeing other people being spoken to disrespectfully. Never happened to me. And the reason is, is because over the last 12 years, I've been very smart with my money, like incredibly smart with my money. Uh, I've done very well for a 31 year old in my eyes. And that was just from not keeping up with the Joneses. I've just never looked to impress anyone. I'm sitting here, as we were saying, in a Primark t-shirt. I, I love a bit of Primarni. I don't spend money on expensive things. So I've got a good amount of money in the bank and I've made smart investments. That gave me financial empowerment in the workplace. And I learned more about business and we'll probably talk about how I escaped. Mm. So you said they started, that it was a wedding business, selling things on Amazon. You know, some were successful, some were less so. What was successful and what were you doing at the time to make it so? So I started, an e so it was an eBay business at 18. So I was always selling things at school. So I used to sell dust caps and actually did really well. Don't ask me how I got the dust caps, <laughs> but I sold dust caps, which people then put onto their BMXs and bikes. And I just liked it. And this is the real difference. I came from a family that didn't have money. So when I found money and I started making money, it solves a lot of problems. When people turn around and say money isn't the root of all happiness, they've obviously had a very best, blessed life. <laughs> my upbringing was very different. Money makes me extremely happy and my family happy. So I've known no money. I now know money. I prefer this side. So when I started making money, um, I was trying, trying all different things. You know, go back 10 years, we didn't have the access to the amount of information. So eBay was huge. Market cap in eBay was huge. And I started buying and reselling um, like nice clothing. So like Ralph Lauren, you know, Gucci stuff. Uh, and I started selling that from ages, anywhere from like 10 to sort of like 15, kind of that, that sort of just pre-teen and teen. And that was selling really well, like Hunter Wellies. And then I found a supplier um, who was able to get a lot of this stuff at very low cost, real stuff. And I was able to sell it and I had quite a big margin and I was operating out of my mum and dad's bedroom at the time. What I came into and the reason that one eventually failed is it took up a lot of time. PayPal then started charging fees. So did eBay. They increased their fees. And also I then came into customer returns and refunds. I didn't like that. So I, I, I now have... If I look back at my journey, I like business models with very uh, minimal moving parts and things where there's not a lot of customer issues. So I tried that. I tried a wedding business with an old business partner where we converted teardrop trailers into gin and like uh, coffee bars where we let them out to wedding businesses uh, and like wedding events. Made money, but logistically there was a lot involved. So I went through a lot of trial and error in terms of trying things. And, and they did make good money, especially in my eBay business. At 18, I was doing maybe three, four hundred pounds a week. Mm. So it was pretty good. Mm. What do you think were the qualities that allowed you to just kind of go for it? Because I, I've never really had anything. Mm. So it's almost like when you start from ground zero, what have you got to lose? I don't come from a family that had money. So if I was going to start something, the worst is going to happen. I'm going to end up with what I had. You know, my mum and dad have always provided, but, 
you know, we, we weren't we weren't blessed with loads of money. So I didn't really see any other way. It was like, if I don't do it, what's the alternative? Mm. And I think that's the dilemma most people need to solve. If you don't fulfill some form of purpose or fulfillment in your life, what's the consequence? Most people end up with anxiety, depression and a midlife crisis mm. because they look back and they think, I did fuck all. I will never look back and think I did fuck all. I do everything I want to do. No one tells me I don't want to do it. Mm. I love it. <laughs> Though it's it's interesting because, you know, no matter where you come from, you the majority of people follow what they see and what they already know as opposed to being like, actually, I don't want any of this. Um, I want to do something different and sort of, you know, try. Because you were saying that, you know, even at an early age, you were already trying to you know, sell something and be entrepreneurial. At which point did you end up in the nine to five? And was the entrepreneurial side always coexisting with the nine to five? Yeah. So I got my first job as I was just turning 17 and I was selling sports equipment. That didn't last very long because I actually asked the owner, how do you start a business like this? So I was so naive at the time. I emailed him. They looked into me and I'd already made folders about ordering from Alibaba. And I asked the owner, how do you start a company like this? I didn't even, it didn't even occur to me that he's going to go, right, direct competition. And I got sacked instantly. I wasn't even in the job long oh, wow. because I had a job. And then I just wanted to figure out how do you start this business? So if I look back at my journey, I've always been reverse engineering how someone makes money because I think deep down, I don't come from money. So I'm almost like, I don't want to not have any money because I know it's tough, it's stressful. How do I make money? I need to reverse engineer how people make money. So I've always kind of looked for blueprints. So it's always, it's always been in me. And I have, I have great key traits. One thing I'm very proud of, and my mum and dad can take full credit, I have been incredibly disciplined through seeing them. I have discipline levels like no other. I am accountable uh, for my good, the bad, the ugly. I own all of it. I accept all my flaws and all my good points. I've never blamed the world. I don't blame my background. I don't blame the people that I used to hang around with. I am the change and I will go where I want to go. And I think that's just kept me very mentally sane. I don't have I don't have anxiety. I've never suffered with mental health issues. I'm very thick skin. I can compartmentalize. I can, if I'm going through something, I can literally put it in a box and that that be that. And I get that from my dad. And then the drive to make money is definitely from my mum. So I've just always, and then when I went into the workplace, I just knew that I didn't like the whole, Aaron, why are you late? Well, there was a car accident, you know, and it's just being chased for everything. And I just thought, mm. I've got two options. I could be assigned a life or I can design mine. Mm. I chose to design So is this like a sense of, of freedom of not being told what to do and being more proactive in the things that you decide to put your time into? Yeah, I think because I had my son really early. So oh, uh, I just turned 20. Mm -hmm. So... When we had our son, we had no money. Like we were living, I don't know if you've ever experienced this, for many years we shared a car and we lived on the orange for years. Like living on the orange, playing petrol roulette, where your car has just got that last 50 miles Forgive left. Forgive me, I don't know what that means. So we lived, we shared one car, an old car, where when, you know when the fuel's low mm -hmm. and then it goes onto an orange bar, an orange bar pops up on your, your display to say you've only got 50 miles, you need to top up. Right. We lived on that for years, on the orange. So we were playing petrol roulette all the time, sharing a car. We had no money. So when I had my son, you know, look, I'm covered in tattoos. I used to have a skinhead. I used to box for many years. I used to hang around with the wrong people. I used to talk very differently. And there was a point where it was like, I need to put my energy, which I have a lot of, which my son literally is the reflection of me. Um, I need to put that into something good. And then I found entrepreneurship and business and I just started pursuing, yeah, freedom. I wanted to do what I wanted to do. So it was the pursuit of time freedom, really, yeah. You said something earlier, and I'm going to be paraphrasing you, which was, you know, I didn't, I didn't want to, you know, be poor essentially. And so is the driver to not, not to have money or is the drive to have money it's both so not having money is no options it's typically falls into a bit of a rabbit hole of problems and you start 
sort of almost wallowing in the fact that you have no money. So it's a mindset thing of that, of having no money that there's, you know, there's a saying, isn't there? It's like, you know, I'd rather cry in a Bentley than cry on a push bike in the rain. It's like, you know, when people turn around and say money doesn't make you happy. Well, until you've had no money, you don't, un no one understands that. I, I know, I know a lot of poor people who have ended up doing very well. They'll agree with me. Money makes you very happy. Mm -hmm. If you come from a family that have money, you've never known anything different. And you'll be like, oh, it doesn't make you happy. No, because you've had it all your fucking life. <laughs> like, live my, live my life. So it's, um, it's then the resources and the options that it gives you, you know, to be able to spend time with family. Like I said, I don't spend money on materialistic things. I have good control. I have good habits. Um, it's just being able to do what you want and not having to go through the bullshit of the workplace. There are so many problems in the workplace and they're not being fixed and they're very simplistic to sort, but they're not. And the problem is no one challenges the problem. And the reason is they're not financially empowered because they've spent years spending their money on clothes, holidays, financing a car they can't really afford. And then what happens is they're left with loads of problems. They've got a big mortgage and they have to work and they have to play this political poker game because they're not financially empowered. I needed to financially empower myself so I can get out of the problem. At which point did you realize that, that you needed to not spend the money, but to continue to earn it? So almost like you don't level up your lifestyle as you level up your salary, your income. I've just, do you know what? I, there was no changing point. I've just always been like that. Mm. When I started earning money at 16 years old, you know, probably, I, I just, I just saved. I just saved and invested, and I've, I've been quite an old soul. I think uh, I like classical music. I like Coronation Street. I like, I like old things. Mm. You know, I like old villages, medieval villages, castles. I, I like Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin. Like, so I think I've always been interested in just a simple life. I think if we look back at the 50s, 60s and 70s, things were a lot more simple. They're, I think people were at peace more. Mm. So I've always been like that. So I've never felt the need to buy things. And I think as we were sort of joking earlier is that at Christmas time and my birthdays, and I'm sure my mum won't see this, but my mum would buy me a shirt that was like three times too big for me. It was from like a secondhand shop. Um, and it would have like a lion on it. And I'd be like, mum, I'm not wearing that. Like I'm, I'm in secondary school. I would get taken <laughs> the mick out of. So I was used to non-designer clothes. So it just instilled good habits. And I just knew that, well, if I want to change my financial situation, I need to save. So I did that. I built up an emergency fund, a maintenance fund, floating fund. I ended up starting a finance business. So obviously I learned a lot about finance. But yeah, I've just... I've always saved. That's mm -hmm. literally kind of the core of it. And that's put me in good stead, you know? Mm. What has been like the biggest flop in terms of the businesses you've started? So I, I went into property with an old business partner without a lot of knowledge uh, and put money into it without questioning things. And I went into a business partnership without really knowing what that entailed and looking after money, structure, I, I didn't question any of it. And I think the biggest flop is that I lost money and I didn't have any kind of exit plan. I didn't have any counter to problems that happened. So it was what I realized very quickly is I needed to level up my education. So I would never say to someone, start something if you have no idea about it or if you don't know what happens in worst case scenario, always plan for the worst case scenario and then reverse engineer. Um, I would say that I lost a lot of money early on and a How business much money are we talking uh, above 10,000 pounds. And, and to me, again, for, from my mindset, that's, that's a lot of money to lose. So I lost that and I had no way of getting it back. I got caught up in a load of drama and it hit pretty hard because I've always managed money so well. And I was quite disappointed in myself that when I look, when I look back, I thought, well, uh, you know, I didn't really know the outcome. I didn't really know what I was doing. I didn't question anything. So a lack of information can make you make bad decisions. That's probably my biggest sort of entrepreneurial business flop. Mm. What's been the biggest success? Uh, the biggest success was probably when I realized um, you could make a lot of money in finance. So when I was working full time, what really put me on a very fast, rapid journey to get out of my nine to five. Although I actually stuck around longer in my job because it was so easy. I could have left uh, quite, uh, I could have left a few years before I did. But my biggest success for me that will always stand out is when I went into London, 
Uh, I didn't even know, for the record, a place called Mayfair. I got invited to a meeting into Mayfair. I never even knew there's a place called Mayfair. So I got invited to this meeting and I was around equity brokers. I didn't know what they were at the time. And they were talking about raising money and I couldn't believe what I was hearing. People were talking about raising millions of pounds like it was, you know, like a fiver. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh my God. And bear in mind, I was covered in tattoos. I used to wear a turtleneck to cover this tattoo because I thought, oh, I don't really want to show my neck tattoo. Now I don't give a monkeys. And after I spoke to this equity broker, anyway, he taught me about what he did and he makes commissions, which is when I then went started um, an investment firm. And I started doing exactly the same because I thought, well, I'm, I'm likable. I can make relationships. I can, I can nurture them. I'm pretty good at that. So that's what I did. And uh, when I was working full time, I closed off a deal that made me just over £38,000. And it took me about a week to do. Um, from connecting with an individual who had the right amount of money to doing the deal, to doing the legals, to doing the checks, to then closing it off and signing it off and getting paid. It was just over a week. And I'd done about 38 grand gross. It was a light bulb moment. And I remember where I was. I was in the kitchen with my wife at the time. I couldn't believe it because I'd never seen money like that come in in sort of just over seven days. And then I knew I'm getting out of my job. Mm. <laughs> and then I felt a financial empowerment. And then I was smart with that 38 grand into emergency, into maintenance, into savings, stocks and shares, our son's account. You know, I wasn't silly with it. Didn't go and buy a Rolex or anything. You know, just went straight in. So when I was going into the workplace, chest was proud, head was high, and I didn't put up with shit. Mm. And, that, and then that continued, you know. Mm. I love that story and the fact that you are, you're kind of, you're feeling your way through it. Like you, you, you notice something, you kind of try to understand it. And not only that, then you go and actually try to do it. Because I think a lot of the times what happens is like, you know, you watch a YouTube video or you hear of someone or like a friend of a friend is doing that. And you're like, oh, and you start making excuses as to, you know, oh, they come from a rich family or they have great connections or, you know, they're smarter, better looking, you know, more sales focused, whatever it is. And so instead of actually just going for it and trying it, you sit back stay in your comfort zone and never actually take that step forward. Yeah. And it's in the doing that you, you know, you have to be in the arena to be able to win the fight or the game or whatever it is. So, and you take that step. I yeah. think that's. It's inaction is the biggest killer for people mentally. It's, it's staying in the same place. That's what I don't like about the workplace is that, you know, you'll have people quite happily and proudly. And look, I'm not here to judge. And, and, and if people want to remain in it, that's fine. But it's not for everyone. But at the same time, it, it freaks the hell out of me when people go, I've had, you know, I've been in this company 30 years and I've had five promotions. I'm like, oh my God, you've been here 30 years. Yeah. What? And you've only had five promotions. How much does that accumulate to? Well, it's about £22,000. What? You do realise if you start a business, your, your salary could be twenty two grand a month. If you do a really good business and it's lean financially and you serve a lot of people. Uh, so it freaks me out, you know, being stagnant and no growth. And I, I've always liked to challenge. I think that's the thing is inaction leads to procrastination. That leads to bad momentum. That leads to wallowing and dwelling and feeling that there's no belief and that you can't do it. And I think there is a, there's, there's like this chain, you know, um, and, but the people that you are around is a massive thing. I got around, I literally changed because I can compartmentalize and I can cut people off. I've cut family members off. Um, it, well, what, it, what's your justification or how do you, like, who if, do you cut off? Not uh, names, but. So, like, so I've cut off a family member mm -hmm. because it was toxic, very judging, um, negative, draining, uh, energy vampire, just not very supportive. Um, and anyone that's like that, the, the bare minimum from a person is support. You don't have to understand, you know, I don't even know you personally, but I, I wish you all the best and I support you because, because we're aligned mindset wise in terms of trying to achieve the best. So you'll have support from me uh, as an absolute minimal. So that's the bare requirement. If I'm not getting that, where, where's the service? Like, where's the value for you or for me? So I'm able to do that again, that, that comes from my dad's side in, in, in being able to do that instantly. When I decided to go full-time into um, entrepreneurship, even though I was working in employment, I applied something called self-mastery where I kept it on the low, but I changed my circle and I got around investors, um, 
entrepreneurs, business owners, just starting in the middle, sold companies. And I went to events and I was networking all the time. And today my phone, my phone book probably worth around about $2.9 billion. There's a lot of phone calls that I can make that are, that are very lucrative for me. So, um, and that's taken me nearly 10 years to do. I, I literally swapped my circle overnight. I did not delay. That's so true about who you hang around with, who you surround yourself with. You are not only exposed to new ideas, but you can see that it's possible. That if this person is doing it, then so can I. Do you believe anyone can do it? I do to a certain extent if you're around the right people. I would challenge someone not to spend a week with me and then think they can't take on the world. And it's vice versa for other people. I spend time with some of my friends in London who do like 250 a year, million, 250 plus million a year. I've got many friends that do hundreds of millions a year. Um, when I'm around them, I am, it's like, it's like I'm on a buzz. It's like I've had four shots of pre-workout upside down. <laughs> you know, it's like I want, when I come into London, there's an abundance of opportunity. And it is, if you're around people who have different talk, who are ambitious, driven, you know, and unfortunately, there's this misconception and we need to get rid of it. You know, people like you and I, we need to talk about it more. Successful people are not bad people. Wealthy people are not bad people. This is this is an insecurity from the poor mindset saying, oh, well, well, they're all bar humbug. They're all Scrooge. No, they're not. They're really wealthy people. Majority of them are really charitable. You know, I know some incredibly charitable, wealthy people. So uh, when you're around them, you're uplifted and you think, even though I come from a council estate or I come from a background, the opportunities now, like I can do this and then it's belief and then it's, it's habits and routine and discipline and going to the gym and doing things day in, day out. It's like, I get asked all the time, how did you grow so quick on TikTok? I've, I've been on TikTok now 16 months. I've posted every day, three to five times a day. How do you have time it. to do that? I want to know that. <laughs> Look, we can do a TikTok right now. <laughs> I could do a TikTok right now and post it. And what's it going to take? 55 seconds? Mm -hmm. So, look, I'm, I'm a big believer in um, people say, how do you post three times a day? It takes no more than five minutes. Plug in. I've got a mic. I always bring it with me. Plug it in. Pick up your phone. Hey, everyone, today I'm going to teach you three best ways on how to build a business. Blah, 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 blah. Da, 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 da. No, hashtag post, right? That's one. Hey, everyone, if you want to escape, you know, I'll do it. I'll do three videos in two minutes. You know, like it's so it's, it's in action. It's just like, get on with it. Mm. You know, it's like, I'm just very action, action, action. We'll come back on the TikTok thing and the social media thing, but just touching on surrounding yourself with inspiring, successful people. And you're talking about your, your black book in your phone. How do you do that? How do you become friends with and, and, and hang out with and spend time with successful people? Uh, I get this one all the time and I just keep it really simple is just networking it's just going on Eventbrite going on LinkedIn going on Google and booking the ticket and the train ticket and, and go on your own you know um, Leah came to our events uh, our, our event on on her own and I love when people just turn up on their own because it, you're stepping outside a comfort zone you know that was one of the reasons why I started an events company with my business partner is because I wanted to make it more accessible and more friendly to people who who don't come from money. Uh, that's why we make the ticket so affordable. Even the VIP, they're so affordable. And we're putting people who normally charge a lot of money to be on stage, but because I have relationships with them, they'll, they'll, they'll do it as a favor. Um, but then we charge very uh, affordable tickets for one of the most incredible events you'll ever go to. And I just was networking all the time. I never had an agenda. I would go into London. I'd go to marketing events, investor events. I met um, an incredible woman called Lisa Palmer. She's um, very well connected to some high profile people. I built a very good relationship with Lisa. She introduced me to people. Uh, this morning, as I was just saying, I've been introduced to a celebrity PR guy who's going to get me into film premieres now because that's a big push this year. I'm on TEDx later on this year. So like I've been given these opportunities now because um, I've made the right connections and I've had no agenda. It's not like, oh, Maria, if I come on your podcast, can I, um, you know, hopefully I'm going to meet, you know, maybe I ought to get some free photos, you know, from the guy. There's, there's no agenda. I'm just, I'm just here to add value. And I've, do, I've done that when, wherever I've gone. And, and I've also understood very early on, you might meet someone thinking, oh, I really hope this is my investor or this is the one that, that blows me up. 
it might not happen immediately, but if you nurture that relationship and you give, 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 six months later, they might come back in and then you understand why they were in your life. And I've had a lot of that. <clears throat> so it's exposing yourself, going to events, you know, making connections, not being afraid to approach a person, and then, you know, nurturing the relationship by providing value and being helpful and not having expectations of an outcome straight away or if ever it's just about planting those seeds yeah and continuing to do so yeah literally and you know i do a lot of content which is very similar to simon squibb simon squibb's a good friend of mine and we have very much the same ethos around that and the same value and i'm a big believer of that and if anything he's really confirmed that that's and what we were talking about this on the way up is that you know, when I started the educational company, the breakout program, again, I, I only charge a very small fee. It's a one-off fee, but the value and everything that's included. And separately, I have all these masterminds where some of my friends come on. Um, Simon's actually one of them. And they're worth hundreds of millions combined. The value, like what you pay for it to what you get. It's almost like, is this a joke? Because I've really understood that you nurture, 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 nurture. You work on an 80-20 rule. Give 80% of everything for free and the 20% that will come back at some point is very lucrative. And it is. You ju I've just nurtured relationships. And because I was in finance and I started raising equity, I learned also very quickly you can't rush an investor. So the average relationship to be able to ask for money out of someone's pockets is about six months. Some people go, oh, you can build a relationship in five weeks. Uh, well, fucking teach me. Because uh, most of my investors who I work with now every year, uh, it took me six months, if not longer, to build that relationship for me to be able to go, can I have a hundred grand? <laughs> and then they go, we really like you actually. Yeah, we'll try it. It's similar to my business, Executive Search, where, you know, it's a high ticket product service where, you know, kind of if you go completely cold out of the blue, it's very rare that somebody will start working with you. It does happen, but it does take time to build those relationships for people to trust you. Um, so yeah, I would say like that six month period is, yeah, like at a minimum, at a minimum. Minimum. Relationships um, are all about give as well. Because ultimately, if there is synergy and you know there's synergy, uh, people are very smart, especially people who have done very well. They can smell bullshit from a mile away. You know, even now I can I can tell when someone wants something. So I, I there's, there's early signs. So you think if people are doing tens of millions of pounds and you're trying to go down that route or whatever, you know, whatever relationship you're trying to find, if someone's been in, in that industry, you're not going to be the first person that's thinking I could use this person. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's just about being likable. Just, hey, what'd you do? Great. Do you want a coffee? Great. You know, how's, do you have a family? Great. You have kids? I've got kids. Great. Do they, you know, just, and then start and then Zoom call, another meetup. I'm in the area. Do you want to meet up? And, and slowly, slowly, just like you would any relationship. And, you know, if we fast forward 10 years now, you know, I've got Lord Sugar's investment banker on WhatsApp. <laughs> you know, pretty proud of that. Uh, and many other people. So, but it's, but it's taken 10 years, you know, so it takes time as well. What advice would you have for, you know, a young person who is frustrated in their nine to five, they're not happy, they know they can do better. Like, how do they start a business? How do they break out of their nine to five? First thing I say to anyone before you start thinking about business, because a lot of people now thinking about businesses, but they've jumped the gun. Question is, are you even cut out for it? So that's the first thing is like, Four evaluations, self-evaluation is number one. Sit down with yourself and write on a bit of paper. What key traits do you have at the moment? Because what do you need to run a business? High levels of discipline. You need the ability to make sacrifices. You need to be able to say no. Like not enough people say no. You do need to be selfish as well as selfless. You need to have good time management. You need to consider everything about your world. Are you cut out for it? And then if you're in a relationship, the other thing to do is actually before you start going into business, if you're with a partner, you need to go, by the way, I'm thinking about starting a business because your partner might go, no, 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 no. You go to work, you bring home your money every month, don't even start getting ideas. Yeah, then they might not have the same risk appetite as you. Yeah, so that's a whole other element. So it's self-evaluation first, then it's time evaluation. Um, unless you're backed by loads of money and you can be introduced through parents or whatever, um, if you don't have money, you need time. 
are you going to be truthful with yourself? How much time do you spend scrolling on Instagram? How much time do you consume opposed to creating? How much Netflix do you watch every week? You need to claw back time. Are you willing to work weekends for the next two years and not go out? I didn't go out. I lived like a hermit for a long time. I didn't do anything. We I just have a kid as well. <laughs> yeah, and I had a kid and yeah. we didn't have money to go out. So that, that was the other thing. Mm -hmm. I couldn't go to the IV because I didn't have any money to go to the IV. So there was no option. Um, and then it's your financial evaluation as well. So looking after your money, how many outgo you know, what's your outgoings? What do you bring in? What do you need to live on? And then finally, it's your social evaluation. The people I'm around now, are they going to elevate me into a successful business? If not, you need to start trimming the fat. And I always say to people, very simple task, open up your phone and have a look at the last 10 WhatsApp conversations. In the last 10 WhatsApp conversations, how many of them are ambitious, driven, supportive, positive, non-gossipy, non-drama, and been off the person that only sends you memes of cats jumping off buildings and shit like I that. I do think that there is a, a benefit to that as well, because it's like all work and no play, as they say, you know, you need a little bit of fun in your life too. Yeah categories but I, I build that in by category so monday to friday during my active working hours um i Which won't are? have shit going on uh varies each day but typically i, I wake up uh 5 30 6 in the morning i'd be in the gym 6 30 latest uh maybe cut off at eight in the evening nine i don't know it depends what i whenever i start working to be honest with you but they're but active hours it's not like you start work at six and you're actively working for th for 13 hours i might do an hour and a half in the morning piddle about for a bit then i do an hour at 11 a.m an hour at 3 a.m you know so whatever but um i'll only have the active business conversations i won't you know i wouldn't take half an hour out during an active day where i'm in the zone um, to start talking about, you know, what's going on in the world. So, but, but then I meet up with friends every six, seven weeks. But I, I just, my point is, is that you categorize people who's around you mm -hmm. um, to where you want to get to. Like if you're in a dire financial situation and you want to get out of your job, stop fucking sending memes to people. <laughs> start getting around business people. So first step, you said do a self-evaluation. Were there any further steps after that? Yeah, so it's, it's the, it's the self-evaluation financial time and social and then once you've done those four and you've really mapped it out and i would recommend get a whiteboard and like put it all onto a whiteboard so you can visualize it then it's kind of navigating the crazy world of social media where all these marketing ads when people turn around and one of the biggest hurdles what i'm finding especially running this educational company is i don't know what to do i know i want to do something and i have a family and i have a situation i need to get out of and i don't want to work for someone but I don't know what to do because there's this overload of information. Then that's when I say go and network as much as possible. Because when you start talking to people, you have these little light bulb moments. You're like, oh, I quite like that. And it's it's real. You're actually talking to real people opposed to seeing a marketing advert that's been paid to demographically target you and some consciously pull on your pain points. Go and network with people who are just starting a business. Talk to them. How, how is it going? What's the hurdles? And then you'll start thinking and creating your own ideas. So that would be the the immediate, that's all I'd say, go network, network, network. There's something about being physically present with people that makes a huge difference. I mean, I'll use an example from my own life now. So I do this comedy writing course, which is just to get me into the habit of writing in a different way, which is helpful for any kind of content. Anyway, it's over Zoom, which I did not want, and I hate being on Zoom. Yeah. You know, if anyone requ if anyone that I don't know wants to have a Zoom conversation with me, immediately, no, like mm. I will not do it. Phone call, fine, but not like a screen. There is something that just, I don't know, it's it just doesn't work for me. And whilst it's great to, you know, have the ideas of it, but you know, you're kind of, on your own, you're with your own personal energy. And there are some brilliant people who can raise you at like Tony Robbins. I mean, he can, you know, over the screen, it kind of translates. But then I went for a lunch with a friend who is also a collaborator and we're talking about ideas, how to work together. And just by being physically present, something like flips. Buzzing. I came back and I was like, we can do this, we can do this. And it's just, you feel inspired and I think now that we've spent so much time on our own, in our own homes, and don't get me wrong, I'm all for flexible working and working from home, but that idea of being physically present with people who are inspiring, who you look up to, it just 
It's another level. Your physiology changes. Mm. Like your actual physical body, something happens in that. And that's yeah. highly, highly underrated in our social media world. It's, it's a dopamine hit. I mean, I'll, but it's a different dopamine hit to what you get from social media. Yeah, it's much more longer lasting. I believe. I think also one thing I've learned uh, most recently. So this goes out to a shout out to Jason Greystone. But Jason is not only a very close friend of mine now, but somewhat of a mentor and a business partner of mine. And every time I'm around Jason, he just offers me this energy because he's so insightful and very logical in his reasoning and i can tap into people like this when i'm on a bit of a low or i'm a bit confused and you know when you when the light goes out and you need it re-sparking these people that you can meet up with and jason is one of those for me where he's able to reason with me and just say look zone it back in and focus because the thing with social media is there is a lot of conflicting information so you can watch one reel and think yeah i'm gonna do that and then you watch another reel and you think but he should tell me to, oh, t and then you don't know what to do. And then you, and then you feel overwhelmed and then you procrastinate and you do nothing. So yeah, meeting with someone and sitting down as I do with Jason, it just realigns everything. And there's, there's less noise. You know, there is something very, um, it, it's, it's like harmony, you know, it's just sort of bringing everything back down and staying on one lane opposed to mm -hmm. chopping and changing and, you know, the intersection and then coming back off the bypass staying in your lane and i think that's the thing with social media i've done a lot of videos on this recently is remain in your own bubble and 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 remove and block things you know again go back to the whole say no like i don't want to see that that's not good for me right now acknowledge that there are some things that can be really damaging like social media has a very good side but my god it has a dark side a, and I, i'm talking really deep dark side so I think it's important to take note of who you listen to and remove what's not good for you right now and get back to face-to-face -face stuff. Mm. You're so right about social media having those two sides of the coin. I think like it's like that with everything in life. You can go and speak to one entrepreneur and they're saying, this is the most important thing that you will do. And then you'll speak to another entrepreneur who will tell you exactly the opposite. I mean, even like in, in the beauty sector, you know, there'll be one founder saying, well, we tried, you know, to do 11 different brands. And as a result of us just being completely innovative and not really caring what other, you know, what, what our customers or, you know, potentially are saying, we're just going to test it out and see what works. And then somebody will say, no, focus on this just one thing and be very, very focused. But those, both of those things work. So I think there is this polarity in everything, in both advice and, you know, how to do things properly. And I think what we ourselves underestimate is that inner voice that knows what you need to do. Like, you know, deep down what you need to do. Like people can tell you what well, you should do this, you should do that. You know, deep down, if like, if you're not exercising, you should be exercising. If you're drinking too much, you probably should stop drinking so much. You know, you're not earning that much money. Maybe you should be asking for a promotion, going somewhere else. You know, deep down what you need to do. You are the expert on you. And I think the issue with social media is that you're getting so much information yeah. that you forgot to listen to your own voice. Yeah. So shutting that down, like sure, learn from people, but like shut it down and be like, who am I and what do I want? Mm. And I think that's highly under underrated. I think one of the things with social media, if you ask me, I have something at the moment which I'm talking about, people suffer from casual anxiety. So with social media, great you can do amazing things we can connect with people all around the world there's some great things but the, the dark side is is that most people spend their time comparing and it's really bad to compare your life so you know for anyone listening just really analyze are you looking at someone and thinking well i wish my life was like that well you have no idea how they got there and you don't know if it's real because everything is a highlight reel the other thing is uh, being competitive with someone who you have no idea about. The thing is, you said it earlier, I am a believer as well. And I, I've stuck with this on my whole life. And I think that's why I've made consistent, constant strides. I do focus on one thing until that's successful. And then I'll look at something else. You know, you can only manage so much. I actually find it quite scary when people say, 
I'm doing this, I'm doing this, and I'm doing this, and I'm doing this. And I actually think to myself, that's all going to go tits up because you can only do so much. You can only grow so quick. And the problem is you actually lack credibility. I've met many people, and I actually spoke with my business partner about this the other day. Um, we know a few individuals that were managing too much and, and now they've gone off the radar. You don't even know where they are. You don't know what they're doing. And I think what that comes down to is an overload of too much, overwhelm, then you hit procrastination, then you bury your head in the sand. You don't reach out to people because in entrepreneurship, and I'll tell you this, when I left my job, I, again, no one needed to tell me this. I just knew I needed to do it. You've got to put your hand up and ask for help. Entrepreneurs help other entrepreneurs and you can't bury your head in the sand. So when you're balancing uh, not only personal life, social life, because it's at the forefront, and a business, and possibly your employed role, that's a lot for a human being, to, uh, you know, a person to deal with, human being to deal with. And then you look on social media at the business lifestyle in Dubai, uh, you're going to go, you're going to go mad. Mm. So asking for help is another thing in entrepreneurship. You know, when you're struggling, ask someone who's still doing really well and say, it's fucking tough. Have you got any advice for me? Come up and see me or let's get a coffee. Of course. Why didn't you ask earlier? You know, or what is it you need from me? You know, there are a lot of helpful people out there and, and people seem to take this load of, oh, I can't, I've just left my job. I can't ask anyone because then they're going to think I'm a failure. And No, ask for help now. Otherwise you're going to lose it all. Mm. I'm a big believer in that. And it's really interesting when I was younger in my sort of, you know, 10 years when I, well, 11 years ago, when I started my business, that didn't phase me at all. I was like, well, I don't really know very much. So what's the harm? You know, I can just play dumb and, you know, just ask questions. And that really worked for me. But 10 years later, somehow I've created this limiting belief. I was like, well, I should already know all of these things. So I shouldn't be asking about it. And so it can creep up on you at any time. Like even if you did that before, all of a sudden you can kind of catch yourself like, wait a second, that's actually not helpful. And I didn't even used to think like that before. But talking about what you were saying about comparison, I find that's a really interesting one with anything that is triggering for you. So you look at someone's life and they are, you know, good looking, going to Dubai on holidays, Maldives, whatever, you know, earning this money. You look at them and you think, oh, they only got to where they are because they're young, good looking, rich parents. And it makes you feel bad about yourself. But that in itself is not a bad thing. Like feeling uncomfortable and feeling triggered isn't the the enemy here. It's showing you what your values are. So maybe you want to be going on that holiday or maybe you're looking at somebody and you're like, actually, I want to start a business. So the the pain of comparison isn't what it is on the surface. Like you need to look deeper and figure out what it is. And it can actually be a huge driver. I know there is other podcasters that are, you know, several steps ahead of me. And yes, I feel jealous, you know, like, oh, you know, how come they're getting these sponsorship deals or, you know, it looks like they're getting all these downloads and I'm still stuck at this level. But it's giving me an insight as to what I actually aspire to and sometimes I realize, you know what, I don't want to go on that holiday in Maldives, but I want to take some time off to rest and bringing it back to what it actually I need. So it's all, everything has a pro and a con yeah. and it's the same with comparison, but there are some people of just like, they just make you feel bad nonstop. Yeah. So there could be people who you aspire to and you look up to that push you that don't trigger you quite in such a negative way as well. Yeah, I think also take time out of it as well. Too many people are using words such as quick, fast, tomorrow, within 12 months. You know, the other thing is as well is that we're seeing a lot of that and that puts pressure on people. You know, if I'm going to do this, I need to be successful in 12 months. You know, there's this great quote, um, I don't know it line for line, but it's something like, you know, people will remain in a job for 30 years on the same salary, try and start a business and it doesn't work out. They're not earning the £10,000 a month within 30 days and then they give up and they go back to the job that they're going to remain in for the next 20 years of their life. You know, you need to have longevity. I think being content, you know, this is underestimated. I think I'm so comfortable in my own skin that... I don't care whether someone who started last month overtakes me. I'm just, I'm just not bothered about what other people are doing because I, I live in the real world and I'm around people who are, you know, ultra successful and 
uh, and they are they're in their forties or they're in their fifties. You know, the average um, the average millionaire who turns millionaire in the UK is forty one years old. So it doesn't happen overnight. There's unicorn moments. I think the other thing is we need to separate unicorn moments. Too many people are focusing on unicorn moments. What are unicorn moments? Where you blow up overnight. You start a YouTube channel and all of a sudden you get a million Overnight followers. success. Overnight success. They are unicorn. Could both you and I be a net millionaire? Yes. Could we both be a multimillionaire? Are we likely to become a billionaire? No. It's just as God's honest truth. We're very, it's very unlikely me and you are going to become a billionaire. It is a unicorn moment. Um, they do happen, but you, you really have to serve the masses in order to do that. And you have to have something very unique, right? So I think just understanding that things take time. If you want to escape your nine to five, um, be very empowered that it's possible, but it may take five years. Some people go, five years? Yes, five years. Yeah. Well, I saw an advert the other day. It said 12 months. <laughs> right, okay. Well, it's not going to take 12 months. It sells on social media. Yeah. Maybe you're a unicorn moment. That might happen. If you increase your chances, great, and it happens, great. But time, I think that's the other thing. I was prepared and I accepted that I knew what I wanted, but I didn't have a time length on it. Mm. I was told by a very successful uh, business owner a long time ago, he said, what is it you want to do? This is when I was like, I was like 21, just, you know, I was getting, getting into the thick of it. And he said, if I'm giving you any advice, he, he made millions and done very well. He said, just enjoy it. I promise you now that the best thing to do is just enjoy it. Because if everything you told me tonight, if you really want to do that, I promise you now you all you are going to, you can call yourself a business owner. You're just a problem solver. That's all you're doing. Every day you're going to have to solve problems. But enjoy it that you get to do it and that you've made the choice. And I was just like, yeah, I love that. Mm. And I've, I've adopted that all the time. Every day is a problem. And you've got to solve it. Mm. The aspect of play and having fun and enjoying what you're doing as opposed to it being, you know, all about suffering, a challenge, something to constantly overcome and being in that negative space, the the playfulness, the fun aspect, I think, again, is underrated. It's not like you have to be, you know, going out to parties and, you know, having this kind of like frivolous, frivolous fun. It's about just enjoying the moments and when things are really challenging for a very very prolonged period of time then something is not working I heard this saying about sort of you know this 30 like third a third a third like a third should be you know you should feel challenged you should feel stretched it, it's it's going to feel uncomfortable then a third is like well it's it's okay it's neither fun it's not bad but it's kind of like this may kind of zone and then a third is when you're enjoying yourself so if any of those are kind of out of work that means you either have to put a little bit more effort in and you know maybe take some more take yourself out of the comfort zone or if it's too much then kind of put yourself into more of the the play the fun um i'm saying that because intellectually i know this but i don't always follow that rule so there's something that i'm working into my own life you know, so. th th there's also something as a massive driver is Frank Sinatra said it, the best form of revenge is success. So the other thing that can really drive you forward is using pain points such as people haven't believed in you or people have said you can't do it and really using that energy to drive you. I did that with my family member who I cut off is that for a long time uh, made me feel very little, you know, would say things over years and years and years because of what I used to be like, you know. And um, I don't think she could quite uh, fathom that I have changed and that, you know, now I'm, I'm, I'm doing all right. And it was that it was that negative jealousy. And I really channeled that energy into making sure that everything that I've said that I'm going to do, I do. And also in the workplace, it's like for people who do want to get out that they are going to want you to fail. If people get whiff and I actually advise no one, if, if you're building a business in the workplace, as did I. For years, I kept it on the hush-hush. No one knew a thing. Like, no one knew anything until they started to notice socials, my website, and then it became a problem uh, where things changed for me. But is having that control to use energy to make sure that you really actually go through with what you say you're going to do and make it a success and have a... You need to have a deeply rooted reason why. Like, something that is going to be a consequence or a repercussion... I always find people tend to have this inaction because, well, if it never happens, nothing's going to really happen. Well, if I don't make it a success, I'll just carry on. My life won't change. 
I needed to change. So, and I wanted it so badly. So use like natural drivers. Maybe someone said to you, you're never going to do it. Maybe, maybe a family member has always put you down and, and said, you don't deserve that. You know, just, just do the normal thing. Using those drivers, they can really propel you. Mm. Talking about doing things whilst you're still employed, something I, one of the social media clips you talked about, it's like, well, you know, what you said is like quietly quit your job and concentrate on building your own business whilst you're at it. Yeah. Do you stand by it still? Absolutely. But again, it was in context. Do you know how many people went, oh, you can't promote that. And it's like, listen to the video, dude. Like it was, it was a four and a half minute video. Literally listen to what I said rather than taking the first 30 seconds because so many people get triggered. I absolutely back quiet quitting. So for the camera, quiet quitting is okay if, there we go, the caveat, the, the key word, if you are disrespected, you aren't valued, you are spoken down to. If you are the cleaner and the boss or the senior manager talks to you like shit, it's not, it's not acceptable. So if you were the owner and I was the cleaner and you came up to me and said, right, do that. I'd go, who the fuck are you? If I was me, I was financially empowered and I'd be thinking I'm fucking earning more money than you anyway and you don't even know it. Do not talk to me like that. So, and, I, and because uh, when the respect is lost, you'll see a different side of me, like I'll change. And with quiet quitting, if you are being disrespected, you are not valued, you're not appreciated, you're overworked and you're spoken to like shit, why would you not quiet quit? Like you're gonna lose yourself as a human being. You lose a backbone. No one ever spoke down to me in the workplace, which is why when we had these meetings and why a lot of these clips end up getting millions is because when I would sit in a meeting and there would be this roundhouse, I'd be the last one to talk. I was fully aware and learned very quickly, I'd be the last one to speak to whether to speak or not. And if I didn't agree with something, if new changes were coming in, I am that guy that went, no, I'm not doing that. And it'd be, oh, Aaron, why? Oh, I'm not doing that. You sh And I, I pointed at one of my old managers and said, you should be doing that. I said, why is that now rolling onto us when that is your role? And where were you last night for three hours on shift? Because you disappeared. I said this to one of our managers. And she said, it's got nothing to do with you. I was doing my no, 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 no. And I went, no, no, no. Where were you yesterday for three hours? You disappeared off site. So why is this role now being given to us? Because I had money in the bank to leave at any point. I could go, do you know what? Fuck this, I'm off. Mm -hmm. I could get off and leave. No one else can do that because they're all like, oh, I'll do it. You know, I'll do it. Yeah, I'll do it because I need to pay my mortgage. And I used to think, Fucking start saving your money and get rid of your finance car that you keep turning up in. Aaron, why do you drive a little KA? You know, I used to drive my little KA to work. No one knew a thing. And I used to think, stop financing your Audi for 600 quid. <laughs> start putting that in the bank. And then maybe when you get spoken down to by this little graduate squirt, you might have a backbone to say, who the fuck are you talking to? Show some damn respect, boy. You know, there's stuff like that. But people won't speak up. I would always speak up. I mean, no one said a fucking word to me. Um, well, it, yeah. comes back, it comes back down to that independence and freedom, which is massively the financial freedom. Yes. Because when you have financial freedom, then you have options and you can have much stronger boundaries because you're not afraid of losing something because yeah. of the way that you're being treated. And I think that's the problem, the pain point that you are kind of leaning into on your social media is this idea of, look, you know, you can be in an, you can be employed and you're treated well, you know, you're getting promoted, you know, even looking elsewhere, getting another job elsewhere. But if you're in a position where you're afraid to lose that job for fear of losing your income, mm -hmm. then of course you're going to be constantly in a position of, you're not going to be in a position of power because anyone can fire you at any point. Yeah. And then what are you going to do? So, do, do you know, something that's really scary, 43 million working adults hate their job. That was a survey done. 17, it's something like 17% increase in the last year in depression due to workplace issues. You know, people are going home and falling out with their partners and not talking to their kids because especially men, um, they don't tell their wives, you know, I'm really unhappy in the workplace. They, they bottle it up and they're going home and they're arguing with their wives and the wives are thinking, why are you arguing with me over nothing? It's because they're struggling in the workplace, but they don't want to raise it. And it's because over a period of time, they're being spoken to like crap, bullied, harassed, and, and they don't speak up. I've worked with guys, big burly men, six foot four. They don't say a fucking word to some of these little squirts, male or female. They don't say a word. You know, I've been in, I was in one meeting and they had this little dongle thing um, and it was like a regional meeting. And this guy started screaming at one of the managers. 
And I was looking at the manager thinking, fucking say something. Oh, I'm going to say something. Fucking say something. Stand up, stand up for yourself. Jesus Christ, you are the guy who would watch an old lady be pushed down the road. Speak up for yourself. And I was thinking, what situation are you in financially or at home that you are not saying, enough, enough. To, uh, no one. Well, what, because he's on 80 grand a year. He gets to talk to you like that. Jesus Christ. Have a backbone, man. So that's where I'm like, people, come on, let's get some empowerment. Let's not buy the Gucci slides. Let's not buy the Rolex. Let's not go out to the Ivy because you can't fucking afford it. Have you got an emergency fund? No. Right. Well, that's why you're losing a backbone and you're now depressed and you're taking it out your family because you've been shit with money. So, it, you know, so I really try when I speak with people on a one to one or I'm doing a live stream, people, let's get the money right. Because when you get the money right, you feel good and you're like, Oh, I can breathe, right? Uh, don't talk to me like that. Why? But because one, I can financially cover myself. I can go get legal advice and we can have a battle here and I can cover myself for the period that we're going to battle and I will win against you. You know, it, it really frustrates me because people do lose themselves and, and, you know, and it can lead to suicide and all kinds of stuff. And, and men are a sucker for bottling it up and, and then divorces happen and it was all because of the workplace. Shocking. I think you're right about having to open up those conversations because it's true that bottling it up is certainly not helpful and men particularly so don't do that and then it's a snowball effect on everything in your life yeah and it boils down to also that financial literacy because i think that's something that you know now we have social media we can talk about it we can go and be proactive and learn about it elsewhere but it's not something that is in the educational system at all. I, I know it certainly has not been in mine. And I don't know why I got to, you know, I was always very good with money and managed to get myself out of sticky situations, make my own money, make good choices where I worked, you know, and progress. Um, but not everybody, not everybody is like that. And it's not easily available or it's not easily digestible. And I think different people respond to information about the finances in different ways, like how men learn it, how women learn it. It's very, very different. So what do you think will help people to get that financial literacy? I think there's so much free resources. I think it, it starts with the want. Like you have to want it. You know, you can't convince someone to change their situation. So it has to be a natural want and a desire. But look, there's so much free information. You know, there's there are YouTube videos, there are podcasts, there's, you know, there are incredible books. You know, one for recommendation, which was written by a very good friend of mine, is called How to Own the World by Andrew Craig. He's been in Congress, he's moved $7.6 billion in layman terms. That book is one of the best financial books um, in terms of understanding money management and investing in layman terms without confusing it. That, so you've, but you've got to have the want and like you have to have a pain point. Like for me, it was... Aaron, why have you looked after your money so much? Because I do not want to be here anymore. Like, so my first step and my want is get my money right. And I'm then in a position, um, if I need to leave, I can leave. Like I now have options. If, if you don't provide yourself with those options and make sacrifices, you get caught in this rut. You know, I used to work with some great people, um, but you know, too, too frequently they'd go, oh, I can't wait to book my holiday and get away from here. And I just, honestly, I used to think, why don't you design a life that you don't have to escape? Why are you going on holiday to escape? You know, I book a holiday now because I want to go away and then I can't wait to come back. <laughs> you know, uh, or, or they'll, it's the last two days of their holiday and they're going, oh, I can't go back to work. Then why don't you change it? Like, if you don't like it, dude, or lady or whoever, why aren't you actively changing it? Well, you know, it's too hard. No, that's a lack of information. Go learn. Do you think it's because people get used to a lifestyle because I, my, my circle for a while has been, you know, pretty successful people who, you know, a lot of them work in finance, earning a really good salary, but still feel like they're poor mm. and very unhappy with the, the working situation, long hours, very little respect, having to drop your life, going on holiday and not actually a ho having a holiday because you're having to be on the foot. So from the outside, you know, great cars, you know, great, you know, flats, they seem to have it all, but deeply, deeply unhappy. Mm. So like, what is that? I think, so I know a lot of old school kind of big salary stuff like that, but they do 70, 80 hours, 90 hours, lot of stress, always on call. 
you know, and they're very happy to turn around to people who they meet and say, you know, I'm, I'm this and I'm, you know, I have this on Chelsea and it's all right. You know, it's like no one gives a shit. Mm-hmm. And no one fucking cares about your title. We're not impressed. You know, don't impress me much or whatever they Shania Twain, right? <laughs> um, no one fucking cares is the first thing. Yes, they get used to a lifestyle, but again, it's like there's there's that there's that defining moment. I, I even felt it. I never bought into it, but I felt it. When you start earning more, there's this like, oh, I could go buy that. There's like a little bit of a, but then that's the start of it. You buy it and then there's something else. Well, I think it, it happens you know. before. Like, you know, you've got that bonus coming in. You've know that got commission coming yes, in. Yes, that And be you've dangerous. spent it. Yes. even before you got it some people do i've never done that i, I learned the hard way i used to I, I remember doing it once um but now it's always until it hits the bank but there there is that period of oh, i'm earning more i could spend more and it's controlling that so uh, again jason i'm giving you loads of shout outs here but also jason is a, a a big believer and someone that i really adopted the method and i was already doing it I live a very lean financial life. And and I think when people are in big corporate jobs, uh, you're sucked. Like you're at a high level, you're competing at a high level. There are people on your toes and biting for that job because there's only very far and few now. You're earning 300 grand gross a year. You're taking maybe 170 tops, 160. You're doing 80 hours. You're stressed to the high heavens. A lot of them are on depressants and can't get out of it. High outgoings, bought a flat in London, bought a house in London, got the Aston, got the Porsche. You're fucked. Mm -hmm. Uh, And it's very hard to then go to your family. um, We're going to have to strip back. We're going to have to go move just on the outskirts, little two bed, semi-detached. Going to have to drop down to an electric Hyundai. The wife might be like, it's not happening. Oh my God, you're not worth it anymore. The guy might, you know, whatever. And then it's a real job. Pride for a man. if, If we're talking about a man here, a lot of it, right? Whereas now, if you live a lean lifestyle, we are we have this ability to build a lifestyle business. Maximum profit from your phone and your laptop, huge income, very little outgoings. I'm on about a 98% profit margin, 2% expenditure. I barely spend anything. I'm sitting here in Primark. I've got Next jeans on. Um, I've got some feeler socks on. I never write <laughs> my clothing. Uh, I wear my Apple Watch everywhere. I make very good money. I spend nothing. And so I live a very lean lifestyle. So someone who's earning 300K in a salary, I would never swap that. Mm. I'd always choose my life. Always. So how did you manage to avoid getting sucked into keeping up with the Joneses? Because, I mean, it's it's part of our human nature to want to be similar to other people. And how did you manage to, as I said, get sucked in? Uh, because I, I've always wanted longevity. Like I knew that it could end at any moment. Like I would never rely just on content creation. Like I earn extremely good money just off of TikTok. Um, more than, probably more, nearly more than a doctor. That's just, but, but I know that's not always going to last. It's like an actor or an actress. You're going to be hot for one moment, then you're not. So you have to build something sustainable. So I've always put my, again, go back to a bit of an old soul kind of situation. I've always imagined, uh, imagined 20 years down the line, I've got a good private pension. Uh, my stocks and shares is good. My stocks and shares ice is, is good. Uh, my commodities, my peer-to-peer lending, my, pri- my private in, uh, invest now. So I've, I've made decisions over the last 12 years as if I was a 50-year-old man. You know, like, so I've planned for when I'm 50. Like, I've won. Like, you've reversed engineered it, as yeah. you said before. So I haven't spent money up front to pretend. Like, I have a dear friend who's got to remortgage his house so he can have a marble kitchen because his wife won't fucking sell the house because she got inheritance, which bought the house in the begin with. Um, but but she won't sell. So they wanted to remortgage. He's going to he's gonna have to work. Like, he's, he's incredibly stressed, right? He's a very dear friend of mine, but he is stressed to the high heavens. He earns a good salary, but he's committed now for, like, until he's dead. You know, and, and all because his wife won't sell. If they were to sell, they could go buy a couple of properties outright, live in a nice little house and not work. But she wants this marble kitchen because she wants people to come around and go, what do you think of my marble kitchen? It's nice. And it's not, you know. But the problem is people come around and go, oh, yeah, lovely marble kitchen. And when they leave and go home, they don't fucking care. So it's this, it's this portraying a lifestyle. But I've just never wanted to keep up with anyone. Which, again, which is also why I don't think I suffer from any mental health issues because mm-hmm. I'm only in my own little bubble. Mm-hmm. Like, I'll leave here and you know, I'll just walk along and I'm happy as Larry. Mm. I think that's so powerful. And getting into that mindset, 
for me is like, how do you, if you don't have it, like, how do you get into it? Because it's something that I battle with myself. I mean, as an example, you know, we shoot this podcast in my home and very early on, I remember there was this really amazing female entrepreneur who I was like so nervous meeting and I was like, oh my God, like nothing is tidy. You know, the kitchen is a mess. Our floors need to be replaced. I mean, you've seen like they have scratches on there. I was like, oh my God, what is I she going to think? Well, probably most people don't, but this is, uh, most people say, oh, what a lovely home you've got. Um, but in my head, I'm just thinking of everything that is wrong with it and everything that is, you know, how are they going to, what they're going to think of me and they're going to judge me. And then that continued on for a while. And then I thought, you know what? It's not the flaws and it's not the mess. It's me that I feel that they're going to judge me for my interviewing skills, that somehow I'm not good enough, that somehow I'm a fraud, I don't know what I'm doing. And then I was like, I have to remind myself that every single day, that to the point that we don't even tidy the kitchen area where you came in, because it's just, that's just the way it is. I mean, within reasonable amounts, I mean, it's not completely messy, but it's, it's, it's focusing to what is exactly the trigger for you is and it all comes down to just not feeling good enough yeah again but that there's a level there's a subconscious level of comparison there like is what are other people going to think mm -hmm. you know i can tell you now your house is far bigger than mine <laughs> but it's neither here or there with me I, i've been to some of my friends house who who have like country hill like houses you know and once upon a time i used to think oh i don't want to touch anything I'll, I'll rock up in a vest i don't give a monkeys now because i realized that i've built the relationships I have in my life, you know, and one dear friend of mine, Michael, who makes hundreds of millions, he's one of the wealthiest guys I know. He is, um, I'll go up to his offices, he's got 250 staff in one of these offices he's got in London, and I'll chill back in his boardroom and I'll put my feet up and, you know, the car. I'm just so comfortable because um, he doesn't judge me. And I've learned over time that the people that you really want in your life or that are going to be around you, they won't judge. Like, they don't give a monkeys. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll, I'll ask, once upon a time, maybe I'd have covered up more tattoos. I don't fucking care now, <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. So it's really nice just to stay in your own bubble. I also, one thing actually, I'll tell you what, you've asked me how with the social thing. Do you know what? There was an element. I took seven months off Instagram. Actively. On I chose, purpose. Yes, I mm -hmm. chose to come off Instagram for seven months. And do you know what? I think that was a foundational moment for me. Um, nothing happens. Apart from <laughs> Nobody cares. <laughs> apart from purity. Mm -hmm. And what it was, seven months I came off and I was able to get clarification. And I really nurtured my finance clients through LinkedIn because LinkedIn is not aesthetically pretty. There's not a lot going on. There's not a lot of flashy stuff. It's very B2B. So I really nurtured that. And that was when I monetized my YouTube, which is disconnected. You know, you create, disconnect. There's no real interaction. Um, so I focused on those two and I took seven months off Instagram. I wasn't on TikTok at the time and it was so pure. So when I came back to Instagram, I was, um, I don't even, I rarely like other people's uh, things. I don't even look at other people's stories, rarely. I follow no one on TikTok. I follow very few people on Instagram and I don't look. I, I, I only consume. That's it. And I think that's that, that's that defining moment. It's that detachment, isn't it? Yeah. That you, you are... Well, present or not present, but you know, you can choose your platforms, but then you put yourself out there, but without having this attachment, like, oh, how many people are watching or what am I doing? And just constantly like second guessing, but worse, constantly looking at what everybody else is doing rather than concentrating on what you're doing. And I will say this with Instagram, TikTok is great, right? TikTok honestly has changed the game for me and it has for so many people. But if you notice this about Instagram, You'll have very, very few people that will like your posts or leave a comment or support you, but you'll always have more people watching your stories. Instagram is for nosy people who don't necessarily want you to do well. They just want to watch and see what you're up to. I actually, do you want to hear something funny that I do? This mm. video, I think, ended up doing like 700k views. Mm -hmm. It seemed to resonate with a lot of people. I block people who don't follow me but look at my stories because they've had to actively find me. They've had to put me in the search bar to then look at my story. And then when I go on their profile and they don't follow me, I've not popped up on their top feeds. So they've searched for me. So you're being nosy. So when I go on and I don't recognize someone, I click on and if they don't follow me, I block them. Why? 
because they're being nosy. But isn't that the point of it? I mean, I know what you're saying, but like that, that doesn't bother me that people are nosy, partly because I'm also looking at what everyone else is doing, but I don't have like a, a bad intent of doing that. Sometimes like keeping up with, you know, what my friends are doing or, you know, whatever everyone else is doing. I feel like it's almost the point of it. No. So again, going back to my ethos and the way that I am, I only create. So I don't do it all the time because obviously I don't look all the time, but as and when I'm sitting there in the evening, mm -hmm. I'll look at what industry they're in and stuff like that. And if I, if I have a feeling, I'll block them. Um, I'll make a decision in my head. Aaron, are you likely to ever do business with them? No. Are they adding any value to you right now? No. Is it likely that they've searched just to have a nose? Yeah. Block. I use the block button all the time. <laughs> And I eradicate. So mm -hmm. I, I actually don't let anyone into my bubble that doesn't need to be. And if I'm not doing direct business with someone, what do they gain? What do I gain? The answer is nothing. Mm -hmm. So again, the answer is computer says no. I guess there's this blur now between your personal and your business life because everything can be seen. And how do you choose to portray yourself on social media? Like how authentic do you go? And like how much of yourself do you share? Or do you go more down the professional route and be like, what value can I bring to my community? And it's actually not for my friends and family. It's more for a completely different audience that, you know, will benefit from my knowledge. So I think there is this, this, this blurring of lines and also different ways of doing things. So, you know, it's, it's deciding what is the per like, what do I want to get out of this? And like, what do I want to actually do with this? Like, what is this tool for? Yeah. Um, and I think that can be very confusing. And I think for my social media, I'm like, I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> Honestly, like, you know, I think I'm getting a feel for it of like, what do I want to do with it? And, you know, when I'm saying, well, I'm a lurker as well, that's probably why it's quite static because it is about observing rather than interacting. Yeah. See, that's that's the thing is the difference of if you're watching someone and you're interested or you think there's something to learn, uh, I'll drop voice notes. Like I do voice notes for everyone. So that's typically if I'm reaching out. Oh, see, I, I don't mind voice notes, uh, especially on WhatsApp. I'll listen to them 1.5 or 2 speed. Um, I'll only do it if I'm interacting on something a little bit mm -hmm. more intentional or longer or whatever we're talking about. But the thing is, um, I, I do only create, I, I rarely consume. So that keeps me very mentally sane. But yes, you're absolutely right. Having a purpose. A lot of people don't really know why they're on this. So I've got six accounts. Aaron Knightley Official, Peak Performance, The Breakout, TikTok Growth Program, Knightley's Roundtable Podcast, and my lifestyle one. See, that so was they, confusing for me because I wasn't sure where to go with that. Yeah, so they all have their own purpose for me. So depending on what traffic I'm driving or what campaign I'm running or what funneling I'm doing will depend on what one I'm active on that week. But it allows people to follow certain accounts and I'm able to upload the right thing to the right account. And also I have my exit strategy in mind. Um, you can't really sell a brand, but you can sell a business. So I'm always very uh, conscious of that when I'm building my brand, um, I'm also positioning my business to be sold and that my brand isn't too attached to my other subsidiaries. So I'm very mindful in the next 20 years, I want to sell up. So I need to make sure that I have these um, separate things and that it's not attaching too much to my name. I'll only showcase what I want people to see with my name and maybe sponsorships and endorsements and brands. That's fine. I do all that. Um, but when it comes to my business, uh, I have a purpose. I keep them very separate because I do want to sell. That's, that's the exit plan. So I think you know why you're using them. Yeah, no, I, and, and I think that makes sense because there isn't one way of doing things. I think that's what I'm trying to say, that there is a different way that you can be running your social media. What's your, what's your future plans for your TikTok? I mean, obviously you blew up there very quickly. You said, what, 18 months, you said? 16. 16 months. Um, like, where do you see that going? So that's a bit, so this year for me, so 2024 and TikTok. So one YouTube is a massive focus for me. That's the mothership. That's where I'll end up um, really uh, growing and, and my efforts going into. But TikTok is so new, it's evolving. I've started at the right time. I've grown organically. I've done over 260 million views plus now. I grow, I've grown over, I don't know, I'm at three, maybe 305,000 followers in a very short period of time. I've monetized incredibly well. I've seen what it can offer. I've seen what the plans for this year. For me, it's huge global awareness. I've been seen pretty much in every single country. I've been duetted, stitched in every country. I've been offered 
so many brand deals. I've done so many brand deals. I've had a lot of sponsorship, a lot of endorsement money. And now what it's bringing in to help my brand is such things as TEDx talks. I did a journalist interview the other day for it'll either be BBC or Sky. I'll have more. I get invited now to private parties, events. Um, it's opening up doors that other, you know, return on time invested is a big metric for me. So when I look at things, I think, right. So for example, to help promote your podcast, my clips will do very well on TikTok, which will then people will want to explore the full podcast. So my return on time invested at the moment is immediately on TikTok because of how quick I'm growing and the exposure. But it's also bringing in huge clients for my investment business. Uh, it's driven all the traffic to my breakout program by demand. I'm totally organic, so I'm not forcing adverts. I'm getting warm, hot leads coming in all the time. My database has grown massively for my newsletter. I'm able to funnel people where I want on sequencing and marketing. For this year, I just, I'm doubling down on everything that I'm doing. I mean, I've doubled down a lot, but this year in 2024, I'm just going even harder because this time next year, it could be, I could be on shows, I could be on TV appearances. Uh, that's all possible. And I think that will happen. Mm -hmm. Social media growth as a viable business opportunity, would you recommend that to other people? Yes, as long as you build on the front end and the back end. So I'm launching a program at the end of March called the TikTok Growth Program, where I'm going to teach people how to go full time on TikTok. I've already done that. I've already actually got some very successful members who have grown very quick um, and are fully monetized on and off the platform, which is great. So I've got like good case studies already. I would only promote it and teach people as long as you are building a brand, which then complements a back end business. Because this could end at any moment. I'm sure it won't, but you know, just in the event that something horrible happened or you lost your account and all of a sudden this traffic's gone, have you built something sustainable and collected a data that if the worst was to happen, you can contact your data and still move them into the back end business? So yes, like, is it possible to go full time and earn um, huge amounts of money every single month on on a platform? Yeah, because I'm living li literally living proof of it in a very short period of time. Um, but you have to build out that back end business and collecting data is just huge. Like we all know that as business owners, you, everything I do or anyone I meet, I collect data. So like in one way or another, subconsciously, I always collect data and yeah, it's, it's possible to go full time and you can blow up pretty quick if you do the right things, you know, it's all very possible. So what are the right things to do? Uh, solving problems. So finding a problem or a niche, uh, solving it, adding value, engaging. In your early days for your first six months on your growth period, reply to everyone with an opening question, bring people back in, set up your funnel, live stream as much as possible, which is why I've spent the last 12 months live streaming so much. I convert people on, on, on the lives. I move people to masterclasses, webinars, so I, I sell to them. So um, it's all about engagement. Again, going back to your 80-20 rule, I give 80% for free and then I, I ask for 20. Um, that really helps. There are some hacks that you can do with as soon as you post, live stream straight away and it drives a huge amount of traffic to your post um, three to four times a day. Actually look at your analytics. You know, something that Jade uh, Beeson keeps saying to me, look at your analytics on YouTube. Like look what YouTube wants you to create. I don't do enough of it, but I do a lot of it on TikTok. So all of the content at the end of the week, I look at what worked and then I create subsidiary content around what worked. And then it works. <laughs> you know, I already know a video will get 100K depending on what I say. Learn good hooks, learn how to monetize um, and also figure out the most common question. I launched last year in August, the breakout company, because the most common question I was getting through tens of millions of views was, uh, how do I escape my job? I thought, well, I've escaped my job. Um, I did it in a very uh, simplistic way over a period of time. Why don't I start a company about it? started the company the company did pretty well in the first six months so, so the company resulted from the conversations that you were having already on social media yeah mm -hmm. yeah so the demand was created mm -hmm. then i then i put out indicators so i put out submissions forms to say hey if i was to create something so before i launched the breakout program i decided in 2023 in about march time I put out loads of submission form and inquiry and in indications and stuff like that. I had something like 241 people sign up initially. I was like, I've got a business. Mm -hmm. And then I launched the business um, at the end of June. 
and then they went so live. So from getting the submissions and people saying these 240 people uh, saying, yes, we're interested, how long does it take you then to create a program? Uh, so the program's pretty, um, pretty big. Uh, this one, uh, there was no expense spared. It took me uh, from planning, from from planning to having the business launched and the program go live. It was probably about a three and a half month period, but an intensive period. Mm -hmm. So I was on it every week, all the time, every day. I was filming a lot, um, liaising with the team that I was building it out with, creating all the funnels, the sales pages. So it was about a three and a half month period, which is probably quicker than what some people would do it in. But I had all the indicators. I had the huge demand. I had the waiting list. Then I created. So like I'm launching this TikTok growth program at the end of the March. I've already got 88 pre-orders. I haven't even launched, I haven't even built it. Yeah, I'll be honest. So, you know, I'm, but I'm building it, um, you know, imminently in the next few weeks. So, you know, having so many channels, like where do people go and find you? What's like the best place to see what you're doing? I think Aaron Knightley is obviously my main handle. I think most people will find me on TikTok, but then... It, they'll find their way. So just to sort of summarize in terms of all these socials is that they're all touch points. So you'll find where you want to go. So if you come across me and you like something or you do, you find me on a platform, I've interlinked everything. So a customer or a follower or someone who wants to join the journey, they'll find where they want to go because I've made sure that I have a, what's called a 360 touch point. So as long as you come across Aaron Knightley, you'll find where you want yeah, to like go. You'll find it. If you'll, you'll find you somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. You'll find me. Um, this is a question I haven't asked for a while, but what seems impossible to you now, but should you achieve it will change the course of your life or your business? So one of my goals at the moment is to uh, ensure we hit a valuation of around about 20 million uh, by 2030 for peak performance. When I say that out loud, coming from a family that has never had any entrepreneurs, any business owners, never hand-me-downs, nothing, to turn around and say, could Aaron Knightley set a company in excess of 20 million? I know I will and I know I can, but it still seems quite a bit of a pipe dream for me. But that's what we're heading towards. And from the growth we've already had in only a two-year period to where we're going, to what we have lined up this year, and the people that we've got around us, I know it's very much possible, but it still seems crazy to think, well, my retirement will be exiting a company that will sell for millions. And um, that's, that's even saying it out loud. I almost sort of sometimes think, really? I mean, it's Aaron, is that really possible? I know it's possible. Mm. So what will make it possible? Uh, one, a lot of my friends have sold companies for tens or hundreds of millions of pounds. I'm around the right people. Um, I follow a blueprint. Uh, Paul, my business partner, is incredibly driven as well. We have no contracts. We have nothing. In, we have just aligned. We are peas in a pod. Um, we just get on like a house on fire. And we are just very driven and we know where we want to go with it. And also, again, Peak Performance is a company that's been built around serving other people. If you're building a company that's serving people, as long as you are making the necessary processes and steps... Uh, it's a win-win situation. We serve so many people. We build a big database. And also just a final one, we're going into fitness. We now have a clothing line that we're going to be releasing and then we're going to go into subscription models. So we have a plan. And as long as we execute it, we'll, we'll get there. We've got 10 years. Well, I wish you all the best and thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank and you. Wonderful to talk to you. Pleasure's all mine. Thank you. Cheers. You've been listening to Anatomy of a Leader podcast. I'm your host, Maria Vorostovsky. If you haven't already, please follow and subscribe this podcast and I'll see you in the next episode.